Time for the main topic, Rob. Yes, yes, that was a good discussion, but time for the main topic. And as we uh, said at the start of the show and as we said at the end of the last show, it's sophomore stories. We're going to look at the second story from each Doctor's reign, Dave. We are. So I'm approaching this in a couple of ways. Partly I'm looking at how do they work in that role of being the sophomore story for each Doctor, and partly just is it a good story that I enjoyed as well, and, and mixing that all up. Rob, are you taking a similar sort of approach? Yeah, I've, I, we've split them down the middle, Dave, and I've jotted down comments on all of mine, and I'm looking forward to bouncing off whatever you have to say, because we never share our notes before shows. Uh, at the end, I'd certainly like to talk about, and this is this is without notice, I'd like to talk about what we think are the most important of the episodes, which ones, you know, had the most importance to the show overall, or a particular era, or whatever. Absolutely, and... and- so when we divided this up, I politely asked and you acquiesced if I could do all the even-numbered Doctors and you did all the odd-numbered Doctors and you were very relaxed about that. So perhaps we'll just dive in and that means that you start us off with the sophomore story for the first Doctor. Yeah, look, I was surprised you let me have the odds because that gave me the Hartnell one and the Pertwee one and, you know, the, and so on. And I thought, gosh, Dave, okay, no worries. So... Yeah, I'll lead off talking about the Daleks. Uh, what what can you say here? I mean, no bug-eyed monsters, said Sidney Newman, and yet five episodes into the series we had bug-eyed monsters. And it doesn't take a genius to say here that they made the show what it is and built a platform for it, so we still have the show here with us today. I think this is an extraordinarily important story and so much better um, than three out of the four episodes of the previous story. I mean, Unearth- An Unearthly Child is a great episode, but all the Tribe of Gum episodes, they're a bit duff. This is just great 60s sci-fi. I think the Doctor's really firing, you know, it's only five episodes into the series, as I said, and it's really, really enjoyable stuff. It is. It's a very good story. It's one of my favourite Dalek stories. I-, I love it. I love the production values, you know, the the way the city looks both inside and the big model shot outside and uh, and all the rest of it. But as a sophomore story, I think it actually follows on so well from An Unearthly Child because that story is all about the characters just meeting each other. They don't trust each other. The Doctor certainly doesn't trust Ian and Barbara. But as they go through their ordeals together, they start to respect each other. And the Daleks is all about taking that another step further and actually showing them have to rely on each other to get out of where they are and Mm. again that slow build-up of trust between them that then really sort of comes together in the next story there there is this three-story arc before you get to marco polo and it works really effectively on that and i think the great thing about it being a seven-parter is that okay you can call some of it padding and yes i know that the dalek movie took an hour out of this and nobody noticed that you know we lost any plot (laughs) i get that but the extra stuff we have in there, those moments between Ian and Barbara, those moments with Susan, those moments with the Doctor and Susan, add to those characters and we really start to learn who these people are, who the Doctor is. We see Susan. This is probably Susan's best story in some ways. What would you think if an unearthly child had gone straight into this and we just got rid of those three cavemen episodes? Look, I think it would still be really good. I think it still would have taken Doctor Who off in an effective way. I think it is more powerful for having seen the four major characters go through what they went through in the Cave of Skulls and the Forest of Fear before Mm -hmm. they get to the Daleks. It would work without it, but I think it works better because they've already had those character interactions initially and now we're seeing them come together as a crew. Very fair. Shall we move on? We shall. So The Highlanders is the first of mine, the second second Doctor story. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of The Highlanders. I think it's a lovely little historical story and and long-time listeners will know how much i adore the historical stories but what's really interesting with this one as a sophomore story is that it gives the audience a very very safe plot this is a very basic very straightforward hartnell style historical the characters arrive in a recognizable part of history something happens in the first 10 minutes they get separated and they've got to escape history at the end of it and they go through that It's very, very safe in that sense. It's very familiar. We also get basically the two plot strands led by the two ongoing companions. And Ben and this new character, Jamie, I don't know if he'll go anywhere, they're paired (laughs) up and they have one plot sort of going out on on the boat and you have Polly and Kirsty teamed up and they do the other plot on land. And the Doctor sort of gets to flip between the two. Now, within this really safe, familiar story, 
the Doctor gets to be really different. He's doing silly accents. He's wearing funny costumes. He's beating up solicitors. He's, he's wearing women's clothing. <laughs> uh, so, so they give you this safe, familiar story and then put a really different Doctor into it. But, just o- but the Doctor's just over the top of everything. And so I think it's a really clever way to do a sophomore for the first change in Doctor. I find it interesting because what you say, you know, it's a Hartnell-esque historical sort of romp. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But in the context of the Troughton era, it actually sticks out like dog's bollocks to me. Oh, absolutely. You know? it, it, it's, it's like this last bit of the Hartnell era before the Troughton era really kicks off. Yeah, so as, as a sophomore story, I'm, I'm kind of conflicted because I, I completely understand what you're saying. But I also think it kind of sticks out a lot and and it seems you know we just had this big dalek story and we'll go on to trout and you know being in in the modern day and the swinging 60s and things like that and you know tons of cybermen stories are coming up and all sorts of stuff this is really quirky and strange and someone tuning in might be forgiven for thinking they'd gone back a couple of years (laughs) in the show perhaps absolutely and if we were talking here the sixth or the fifth doctor that would be a real problem. I think because it is only the second and this is the first time we've had that change, that slightly longer bit of familiarity is probably a good thing. If you had a really different type of story and a really different type of Doctor in one hit in 1966, Mm. that may not have been ideal. Okay, shall we move on? Uh, Yes, now I've deliberately let you take the lead on this one because I think my views are quite well known to regular listeners so over to you Rob (laughs) okay for the Pertwee Doctor we have Doctor Who and the Silurians to give its full title and I think here Dave you know we've we've had our introductory Pertwee story that's fine but I think this story really sets the tone for the Pertwee Doctor he's not fighting the quote unquote monsters um, but he wants to help he wants to work with them and the ending is still so strong I'm surprised he ever wants to talk to the Brigadier again you know, maybe that's born of necessity with him being stranded on Earth, so he has to sort of keep in good with these guys. But I think this just does set the tone for this very moral uh, Doctor who who will go against the grain and often gets held up as an establishment figure, but I think he's he's anti-establishment. Like, he's got the posh voice and he loves a good Gorgonzola. But, <laughs> but I think he's quite anti-establishment with the way he, he goes against the Brigadier here and the Brigadier just wants to blow these Silurians up. Tell me I'm wrong. No, I think I think you are absolutely right. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm on record many times. This is my favourite Doctor Who story. I think the plot is fantastic. The twists are great. The characterisation by Hulk, both of the Silurians and of the humans, is excellent. It looks great. It looks epic. All of that aside, this is a fascinating story because it you can feel it putting the era together as it goes along. Bessie is introduced. We get a scientific government establishment where there's a crisis going on. We get baddies who maybe aren't as bad as we think they are, or different perspectives. We get a certain amount of moralising that, that lets liberalism that I've spoken about before all coming through. Mm. All of these things are built in. Uh, the, the doctor looking around for his sonic screwdriver. Yes, it was first mentioned a couple of times in the Trouton era, but this this thing of the, the, the doctor having a sonic screwdriver being really techy, all these bits of the Pertwee era just come together very naturally in this story. To the point when he, he doesn't actually use the phrase reverse the polarity of the neutron flow, but he does do something to the neutron flow at the end to stop the nuclear <laughs> nuclear generator. It's building a classic era before our eyes in a great story. Yeah, and I think for that to all be happening in the sophomore story of this Doctor is just perfect. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, going to be not just one of the best. I don't, I don't just say that because it's my favourite story. I generally think as a sophomore, this is going to be one we'll look back on at the end and say we did the job really well. Yeah, agree. Uh, another that I think will be on that, that top end of that list is the Ark in Space. Now, you mentioned, Rob, a couple of moments ago about how much the Highlander sticks out as a sore thumb and the heart and the sort of continues a little bit too long. The Ark in Space is the reverse of that, by far. We have Robot, which is the familiar... Um, letting go of the Pertwee era tropes and putting the Doctor into it, but but the Brigadier's there, Sarah's there, you know, headquarters is there. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, it, it's not a big culture shock. The Ark in Space, though, that is like going from black and white to colour in some ways in terms of the culture shock. 
It looks different. It feels different. It's grim. It's nasty. I mean, you, you think about jumping from the Perwi era to that scene where Noah is being turned into a Wirren. Mm. And, and and you think about what the production team intended, the scene that's been cut out with that, that brutal, harsh cut where Noah begs Vira to kill him. Yeah. I mean, imagine if that had been broadcast, you go from Robot with Professor Kettlewell, you know, <laughs> you know, to, to, to Noah to Noah as half a possessed alien begging his, his fiance to kill him. Wow. Like, yeah. You, you could not have a bigger culture change, but they get away with it because Tom is fantastic. Liz Sladen is there. She's fantastic, but she carries the audience through. We're, we're learning to love Harry. It looks good. This is a story that twice I've sat down when I've got home from work, thought I'm going to watch an episode of Doctor Who as I have dinner, put on the Ark in Space, and an hour and a half later gone, I just couldn't stop. Sorry. I just had to watch this whole thing. Yeah. And I think that's a reflective of the times too. We're halfway through the 70s there, whereas, you know, um, I don't know, something like Silurians was being written in the late 60s. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that was first commissioned and put together in 1969, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Good one. I I have similar feelings about it too. I think it just does set the tone that this is a new Doctor doing new things. And I I quite like this as a, as a sophomore story myself, yeah. And what it does do very effectively is it says to the audience, this is where the Doctor's going now. This is what the fourth Doctor is going to be like. This is what his story is going to be like. So get on board because we're going in a very different direction and they really do deliver on that. Which takes us to the fifth Doctor, my beloved Davo. We've got a soft spot alert coming up, Dave, because for to Doomsday, I've always had a soft spot for this story. I often say it's like a Hartnell story. They land on a mysterious ship. You've got an inquisitive doctor and a large TARDIS team. And maybe it's no accident, because I think Terence Dudley would have been about 60-odd when he wrote this. Mm. He was very old school and maybe thinking of Doctor Who in a, in a much older sort of way. And so Davo's sophomore story sort of takes us back to a, a kind of gentler sort of Doctor Who, which maybe fits with his kind of gentler Doctor, if I'm not drawing too much of a bow there. You know, it's certainly quite different to what you've seen in, say, season 18, Tom, or, or even actually all of Tom's era. It, it really does sort of feel like a throwback uh, in time. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing. It, it, it helps solidify that this is a new Doctor with a bigger team doing different things to me you know maybe the story falls a bit flat for people they don't like the big frog on the throne i get that but the story itself i i kind of like as a sophomore story i can't think of any other davo story from that season i think i would have liked to have seen as a second story i wouldn't have liked to have seen earthshock for example as his second story even though earthshock is wonderful and it would have bumped adric off much quicker Uh, rob (laughs) but do you know what i mean I i would have hated Earthshock to have been his sophomore story. Yeah, that's interesting. Look, I, I agree with you on Earthshock. That wouldn't have been the right one. I have really mixed feelings here. I, I'm with you in terms of finding Four to Doomsday a very lovely, fun, enjoyable story. I've got a soft spot for it as well. I, I see its faults, but I, I get past them because it is, it is quite lovely. It, its problem, I think, does come from the fact that it was pushed into production to be the first story they made after j t allowed the intended first story, Zeta Minor, I think it was, to fall apart. Mm. And they had nothing to replace it until Castrovalva was written. And, and some of it doesn't really quite work in terms of setting up the era. I think Tegan's character just isn't quite as settled as she would become and, and, and doesn't quite work. Adric is phenomenally badly written here. This is probably his worst story. Uh, Nyssa is... Well, I, I guess it's setting the scene that she's going to spend a lot of the Davison era just unconscious or locked up or sidelined. So that sets her up well, I guess, but not in a satisfactory way. And and Davo is good in the role, but I think he's very clearly still feeling his way. Yeah. And, and do I like the story? Yes. Do I sit there and at the end of it go, I know where this era is going? I actually don't think I do, Rob. Okay. What if The Visitation had been his sophomore story? Would that have been a bit like The Highlanders, perhaps? And I was about to suggest that would actually be the one that I would put in. I think The Visitation would be a stronger one. The characters get... The companions get a bit more to do. It's a little bit more familiar. Davison is a bit stronger in there. I, I, I think, actually, that would have been 
a, a better option. But but maybe I'm being a little bit harsh, right? I just don't think at the end of it, I really know how this crew is going to work and, and how this era is going to work. And it really isn't that typical of anything to come. Okay. Shall we move on? Attack of the Cybermen. So mm. we, of course, mentioned this last episode when we had a look at season 22. And I said there that it was better than I remembered. This is interesting because although it's a sophomore story, it is the first story of a season. So it's also a season opener. And it has this role of basically picking up the pieces of, of the twin dilemma where the doctor <laughs> the doctor was just a prick. And, yep. and you know, well, look, we know all the stuff that happened in Twin Dilemma. It's got to pick up from there and reset it. And it actually doesn't do that bad a job. I actually quite like Colin in this you see a bit more of his doctor. You see the relationship with Perry is still antagonistic and I don't like it as much as I, I would like to, but it is a lot better than the twin dilemma. Yeah. It starts again with a bit of familiarity in terms of having the Cybermen and it gives us a very Colin Baker typical sort of story. So I, I think this isn't the best story on the list by far, but it's certainly not the worst and it works and it actually isn't a bad little mini reset for the Colin Baker Doctor. And I, I still think if you'd gone from Caves of Androzani to Attack of the Cybermen, how much better would Colin Zero have looked? Oh, massively so. And this is my point about it too, that it's in such an unusual, no, no, not unusual, unique position to be the sophomore story, but actually starting the his his first season. It's 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 a really weird situation. We don't have that in any of the other classic uh, eras of Doctor yeah, Who. Yeah, yeah, there's been this huge months and months and months long break between the first and the second story. Yeah, it's almost like I almost feel like going to the next story to say that's his sophomore story <laughs> because because this does just sort of reset things in, in in that way. It's it's quite strange. But yeah, it is important in that sense. I mean, it's not the world's best story. I can still watch it and enjoy it. I, I enjoy it more than most people, I think. you know, And I think you do too, based on what we said last episode. Mm, yes. But at the same time, I think it's more important that it just does reset the season. And I, although I think things had already got off to a bad start and maybe didn't get quite back onto the right foot, it does help in some ways that it's not... Um, I don't know, Time Lash or something. Even though I like Time Lash. <laughs> Look, it does. I think it's one of the better options. I'm, I'm going to explore the point you made there, Rob, and, and merge a couple of our ideas. You're right. Had we had Attack as the debut story, the premier story for Colin Baker, and that would have been the, you know, the familiar monster, the dynamic, exciting start, throw the Doctor in, good opening. Then you get Vengeance on Varos as the sophomore. And that's a story where you don't have these familiar things you get to let the doctor sort of breathe a bit and expand a bit and actually show us what sort of character he is and vengeance on Varus, i think would actually work really well as a sophomore story mm, agree with you there for sure okay good <laughs> which brings us to sylve in paradise towers and oh god there's so much to say here dave this is important first and foremost because coming after time and the rani it really is the first Andrew Cartmore sort of sourced and, and, and scripted uh, episode. Although he'd worked on Time in the Running with Pip and Jane Baker, that had kind of been foisted upon him, whereas this was more Cartmore coming into his own, working with writers more his own age, doing things he was more interested in. And I think that shows on the screen. I think it, it comes across as a much better story than Time in the Rani. It's great as a sophomore story for that reason, in that, you know, if the audience was a bit underwhelmed after those first four episodes, they can go, oh, well, this is much better. Um, at the same time, I do still feel conflicted about the story, you know, because my gut reaction is always, oh, I just wish they'd realised the tower block better and those cleaners and, oh, if that fella with the Hitler moustache didn't overact, you know, this could be great. Then again, I think, well, if it was done really realistically, like in, say, Dread, like the tower block in Dread, it wouldn't seem like Doctor Who. So I, I get conflicted with how it looks. I get conflicted with the story and, and such. But as a sophomore story, I think it does sort of show us more of the Doctor and Mel acting more like themselves in the next couple of stories. And I think it rescues the season from the disastrous first story. Yeah, I'm with you more or less on this one. I, I am quite fond of Paradise Towers. I think a lot of the elements actually work individually. They just don't work together. And if they'd had a Russell T. Davies-style set of tone meetings around this one where everything was sort of 
put in sync with everything else, it would have been a better story. But I, I like it. I think it's quite a clever script. Mm. I, I have often equated the first five McCoys with the turning of the cruise ship. And I think Paradise Towers is a very important part of that. This isn't a reset in the way that something like Ark in Space was. This is a gentle turn from the Colin Baker era and where, where Doctor Who perhaps wasn't working as well as it should. And it takes a few stories to get there. By the time you get to Dragonfire, you're much more can't molest. You've got a lot of that sort of dialogue and that tone. Then you hit Remembrance of the Daleks and suddenly the cruise ship's facing the way you want and it's going the direction you want. I like that idea, but could you imagine Colin, though, in this, in Paradise Towers? I can't. No, but also I don't think that the McCoy is quite as his best here as well. In this story, they've kind of just written the Doctor they think they're going to write for the Seventh Doctor. And there are parts of it where McCoy really grasps that and runs with it, and he's he's phenomenally good. Some of his moments, the the stuff with Pex, uh, the stuff with the caretakers, really good stuff. There's also stuff in here that doesn't quite work. And I think it takes the writers a while to really latch on to the McCoy Doctor. By the time you get to season 26, they're writing whole stories that Mm. all pitch to McCoy's strengths as an actor. Yes. In this one, I still think it's a bit patchy. And he's, he's still finding the character and the writers are finding the character. I mean, it is a break from Colin, absolutely. They're not writing Colin. But I do think it takes a while to, to really get a grip of this whole era. Okay. So do you think it succeeds or fails as a sophomore story? Um, it succeeds, but not to the level of others. All right, let's move on. Now, Rob, at this point, I've got to say something. Okay. Sydney, we have a problem. <laughs> yes, Melbourne. Uh, so, when we were putting this together, I went away and researched the different stories, and I said I'll do the even numbers. So I put more time into them, and I researched a story for the Eighth Doctor, and then you sent me the running order that you put together because it was your month to put together the running order, and you had on the list a different Eighth Doctor story. What would you call his sophomore story? I went with the Dying Days. Oh, in okay, you went. The literature route, okay. Yeah, and I'll tell you why, because when I was in fandom in 1996, the New Adventures were the series. Yes. And, and so Lungbarrow was the last Sylvester McCoy story. It just was. And The Dying Days was the second McGann story. It, it just was. And I can go with this. Let's let's do Dying Days then. So, and, and and at the end of our episode, you'll find out another reason why I think this is the right choice because, well, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Robin. The listeners will find out soon. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the Dying Days. So, for, for listeners who aren't aware, The Dying Days was the last Virgin uh, New Adventure novel before the rights reverted to the BBC and they started doing their versions. So, this was a, an, an end of the series. They got to do one book with Paul McGann as the Doctor, and. It was by Lance Parkin, and it really, I think, works so well as a sophomore story because after the unusual cultural nature, shall we say, of the telly movie, <laughs> he is able then as an author to put the Eighth Doctor back into a very familiar Doctor Who setting. We're back in London. It's an invasion with the Ice Warriors. The Brigadier is called out of retirement. Bernice Summerfield pops up. And so suddenly you've got that sort of idea of, okay, look, we know the Doctor had an adventure over there in that, that America place, and it was in San Francisco, and, <laughs> and, and, the, and the Master was different, and, and okay, it was a bit weird, and what, you know, what's, what, what's the temporal law? But I, look, okay, that's fine. We all love McGann, though. Whatever yes. you think of the telly movie, I think everyone loves McGann. And so they get it, and they, they put that sort of that dashing Byron-esque Doctor into a much more traditional Doctor Who story, and they, they show his charm. And they show his wit and mysteriousness and that, uh, that elfishness about him mm. really comes through on the page. And he gets to interact with the Brigadier. And I really, really like it. I'm very fond of that book. And I think it is an interesting choice as a sophomore to take, take the familiar and sort of build the Doctor around that rather than, I guess, trying to make a, a literary, literary sequel to the American telemovie. Yeah, that's very fair. And I, I think the only thing I'll add there is that it, it's just a great pointer too that the Eighth Doctor did sort of come out of the blocks after the telly movie uh, happened and then no more uh, happened on television at least as a very literary Doctor. People think of him as a big Finnish Doctor now, but Dying Days and then a ton of Eighth Doctor adventures for BBC books happened long before Big Finish came along. Uh, so to me, he's a very literary doctor as well. So I kind of like that you did that. 
Yeah, and I'll be interested to uh, hear feedback from the listeners, particularly as to what they think of as being McGann's sophomore story. Mm. All right, which takes us to Eccleston, Doctor Number 9 and the End of the World. Uh, at the time, Dave, this episode really disappointed me, and I can't, looking back, I can't really put my finger on why, but it does sort of point to, on one hand, I thought this was a terrible sophomore story at the time, but now I think it's rather good. I think it's quite a spectacle, even with its 2005 special effects. I think the Doctor starts to show a lot of range. There's there's a lot of comedy there. There's there's even a sense of romance there, even though he doesn't seem like a very romantic Doctor. I think this starts to sketch out what the Eccleston Doctor will do, at least in this first series. Maybe not what he could have been if he'd done two or three or four series. But at least for that first series, I look back on it now and I think, oh yeah, I see all the blueprints that are being unrolled here and and held out in front of me and and you know you get that britney spears music on and it's quite funny and fun and oh i don't mind this at all now but at the time i didn't like it can i ask rob yeah did you see rose only when it was broadcast or did you see the leaked copy a couple of months early i had the option to see it and i did not see it okay so you just followed rose and a week later you had end of the world yes that's interesting because I did see the leaked copy. Um, what was it about two, two and a half months before the um, the series came out proper? About that. And so I had this huge gap between seeing Rose and seeing the end of the world, and I actually wasn't disappointed. I wasn't blown away by it, but I just thought as an adventure, it looked kind of cool. It was kind of quirky. It was safe, and I think this is a theme we're going to come back to over the next few stories. Mm-hmm. It was very safe. But what's interesting is this is the sophomore story where you introduce the Doctor. Because Rose is all about Rose. That's very true. Good point. And this is the one where you start to hear a little bit, bit about the Doctor. Who is he? Where is he from? What's his background? It's only leaked out. There's only little hints. But it's interesting in that sense. It's a safe story. I think it's a fun story. I'm. It's not remotely my favourite. Um, and it was marketed really strangely. I think... The, the, the previews for it and, and the next time trailer for it was so different to what actually came out. That, that's something I remember very strongly, but it, it, it is a fun little story and it's it's a safe one. Having given us Rose and just given us all this information, there's a doctor and a TARDIS and he travels through time and space and Rose and Mickey, da, da, da. <laughs> and then it's just like, let's just have an adventure in the future. Let's show people some sci-fi, having been in contemporary London for Rose. Let, let's do the sci-fi weirdness stuff. Yeah. It's got Zoe Wanamaker, which again is a stamp by the show. Look at this. We, we get Zoe Wanamaker. We're getting guests. We're fair dinkum. Yeah. I'm going to be asking the question to myself over the next half an hour, is this the best sophomore story in New Who? I don't know. But but I think it could be a contender. Oh, well, let's go to our next one then. Well, I think this one isn't a contender. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this is the 10th Doctor's sophomore story, New Earth. Now, I watched this yesterday for literally the first time in... 13 years Mm -hmm. and the second time ever I remember being very annoyed by this when I saw it the first time and again this is um, a sophomore story for the Doctor but it's the opener of a season because of course the opening story was the Christmas invasion yes that's right so we had had that break again looking at it now I actually can see many of the markers of season two or series two I should say are here the dynamic between the Doctor and Rose, for better or worse, and I, mm. I won't, won't go down that rabbit hole, but for better or worse, that dynamic is very present. A lot of the markers that are going to go here, the, the first mention of the Lonely God, for example, is very much here. It actually does a better job than I realised at the time of setting up where this new season is going to go. It is, again, incredibly safe. It is, again, incredibly straightforward, much like End of the World. There is a very odd choice in here, though, and it's less a case of than I remember it being, but there are significant parts here where David Tennant isn't playing the Doctor, he's playing Cassandra, or, for the longer part, he isn't interacting with Rose, he's interacting with Cassandra in Rose's body. And that is a very odd choice for a sophomore story, I thought. It is, but on the flip side, I think this is the first time we go to an alien planet in New Who. I think back to Eccleston's first series, they're either on Earth or they're on space stations and things. Are they ever on an alien planet? I don't think so, no. No, I don't think so either. So it's like uh, the first Tenet story sort of takes, 
you know Im- immediate hold after the the Eccleston era, and, it, and it's just like the Eccleston era. You get to his sophomore story though, and it's like the whole universe has opened up, and we're suddenly on an alien planet, and these cat uh, nuns uh, are both a- an amazing concept, and they look really good too. The um, the makeup there is phenomenal. I think there's a lot of humour. Yes, there is the smugness with Rose and the Doctor, but that's going to be a theme through the whole series, so it's 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 kind of a thing. It's not unique to it being a sophomore story. I think this sort of blows the Tenet era open and says, look, you thought season one was good? Look what we're doing this this series. This is amazing. Look at this. And I think it's good in that respect. So let me put the question to you then, Rob. If this had had Eccleston in it, and rather than having to be a Doctor's sophomore story, it was the opener of a sophomore season, and it was blowing mm. open the series, having but, but with the same Doctor. Do you think that would work even better? I think it would, but I'm biased because I just would have loved to have seen a second Eccleston series. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so I, I kind of think, oh, what if Eccleston was in it? Oh, yeah, that would, of course, it would be amazing. It would be. 10 times more amazing but that's that's bias yeah but but i I guess that point that you made that yes there was a certain amount of containment to the eccleston first season and perhaps this was intended to be the second season of okay we've shown you sort of this nice contained around the earth sort of thing now let's change it up a gear and go out to the universe maybe that would have been an even more evident change if it had been the same doctor yeah i'm I'm, i think that could be quite right okay New Earth is better than I remember, but I still think it's it's just a little bit too safe and just a little bit too naff for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Which brings us on to Smithy, and Smithy's sophomore story is The Beast Below. Now, Dave, I probably have a reaction to this similar to what you have to New Earth, because I always found this episode a bit too... I don't know what the right word is. Try hard. I don't knock what, what it's attempting to do, but it just felt so weird and rushed and it was like you know ideas 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 you know all over the place but where was the character where was the characterization i also wasn't too fond of the doctor being pulled up by the companion at the end of this and and that's something that really takes hold during the smith and coleman era where you know uh, he was always seen to be constantly getting pulled up by um clara about different things i i understand the idea i i get it the doctor's alien and you know the human needs to save him from himself sometimes you know i i get it i just don't like it and you know what to cap it all off i have read that moffat thinks that this is his worst story he says it's a mess so i think i'm in good company by slagging it off um not just as a sophomore story but just as a story in general i think after the 11th hour introduces smithy in a really great way I think his sophomore story is a real letdown. Look, I can't disagree with you. I'm, I'm probably a little bit softer in my criticism of it than you are, but, but what you're saying is, is, is all very fair and valid. Where I think this does get some positive points as a sophomore story, though, is there are some nice moments where Smith gets to be Smith. He gets to monologue. He gets to interact with younger people. He gets to interact with guest cast. He gets to make speeches there there is a lot here where smith gets to really be the 11th doctor and 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 you're right it's wrapped up in a a narrative that doesn't really quite work and so from that point of view from a narrative point of view it probably doesn't really set up or actually really doesn't set up the moffat era at all let's be honest Mm. but does it set up the 11th doctor quite well i I actually give it points for doing that okay no that that's fair I, i just still dislike the episode so much i can't see past it to see almost see the doctor in it uh, to be honest, I, I think it's a stinker. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> um, I, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not that strong on it, but, but fair enough. Mm. Into the Dalek, however, I Oof. actually think is okay as a story. I, it's not yeah. my favourite, it's not my least favourite. It, it's, it's okay as a story, it's a good concept, there's some nice ideas. As a sophomore story, I think this is probably the worst on the list because the Doctor goes backwards in this one in my book. The Doctor in this one is a prick. He is unpleasant. He is callous. He, he, is, he is more callous than Spock on Star Trek. He's, he's nasty. He's unlikable. Mm. And yes, there were rough edges of the Capaldi Doctor, the 12th Doctor, in Deep Breath, and that's okay. It was a different direction. That's fine. 
you can explore those things as well across the season. But I remember a whole bunch of us sitting down at the pub the, the week after this one was shown and talking about it. Everyone just said, I didn't like this. I liked the story. The story was cool. But he was just an asshole. I don't mm. like this doctor. And you can have the doctor be rough without being just, just as callous as he is here. And I, I just think this is a real missed opportunity, a real misstep, this one. And I'll be very interested. This is another one where I'm really interested in hearing listener feedback as to whether I've got that wrong. Indeed, Rob, do you think I've got that right or wrong? I, I think you're, you're spot on. Everything you just said, I could say uh, again, so I'll, I'll try not to repeat it. Uh, look, there are parts of this that are just wonderful. Going into the Dalek, the effect of when they go into the Dalek it looks amazing. Being in the Dalek is a cool idea. Yes. And the, and the things they encounter there. Yes. Um, some, of, some of the storyline wrapped around it is, is a bit ropey and such. The, the Daleks change of personality and, and things. Eh, I can but, but, but take again, it or leave it. it. it it's, it's that safeness that we're used to in, in, in second stories in the new season. If this was maybe episode five or six of the series... I think it would have been a bit more complex, but it, it, it is played very safe and straightforward. I agree, Rob. Yeah, it's it's just not an amazing story, but that's okay. Not not every story is amazing. But yes, the characterization of the Doctor and the way he's coming across. I've, I've told the story on this podcast before. When I first saw it, it was making me laugh because I'm like, oh, look, he's like Malcolm Tucker. Isn't he horrible? Oh, this is hilarious. Oh, my God. They made the Doctor say that? Wow. You know, but then when I rewatched it, I thought, no, that that's an absolutely stupid thing to be doing. I, I can't believe they're doing this, not in a funny way anymore, but in a, I, I really can't believe they're doing this. This is ruining the whole feel of the series. And finally it was toned down. And by his third series, he's just wonderful as the Doctor. But this story, God, it's painful to watch now because yeah, of him. I, I actually wish that Robot of Sherwood had been the sophomore story because I think they'd have a good balance of him being very alien, very different, uh, very, very narky, but never a bastard, never callous. And 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 I know some people like Robot of Sherwood, some people don't. I, I happen to be one who really likes it. Uh, and I wish that had been his sophomore story. And, and Into the Dalek maybe would have worked better a little bit further into the season. Uh, even then, I still, still think they would have had to have toned it down a bit. Oh, oh for sure, absolutely. All right, which brings us up to date with Jodie Whittaker. Her sophomore story was The Ghost Monument. Do you remember that one, Dave? I do remember that very fondly, in fact, Rob. Yeah, so that was our most recent sophomore story. And as I said only at the end of last year when we did all our reviews on that series, I think the idea is good and it's shot wonderfully, but there's stuff going on in there which just doesn't land for me and the journey to find the TARDIS doesn't feel very epic even though it should feel epic and then I'm probably going to take words out of your mouth here Dave at the end when the Doctor genuinely gives up not even after a lot of thought and effort but just throws the towel in really easily like ah oh well we're stuffed okay (laughs) it sent the wrong message about the Doctor in general and to do it in the sophomore story what are they thinking this is where you big the Doctor up set the tone for the rest of the series and it's like oh this Doctor's a quitter (laughs) this Doctor gets hit with you know just a tiny problem and goes oh well we're stuffed that's it I, I couldn't believe that so although it looked good and although the story wasn't too bad that characterization of the Doctor in her sophomore story, give me a break, Dave. That was horrible. It's really funny you say that because as you're saying that, all of my concerns and problems and anger at that come flooding back. But until you had, I just had these memories of this being this really quite lovely, fun, safe way to get to know <laughs> Jody and, and the characters. I remember the lovely visuals. I remember the way they interacted. I remember the way that I, I, I started to change on Graham, going, you know, who is this guy and why is he in Doctor Who? To, this guy's kind of cool. I like this guy. And, and, the, and the rest of it, I actually have much fonder memories of it. You're right, though. That last bit of characterization was a big problem I had at the time. And, 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 and you're right to bring it up. But I, I do think as a safe intro to the characters, for the most part, it, it actually works. And I, I think that of the five sophomore stories in the new series... This is the only one that can really contend with End of the World for the title is possibly the best. Oh, that's saying something about the new series then, isn't it? Because I think I think that bit at the end just kills the story dead. I I, I just can't believe Chibnall wrote that. I, I can't believe that when faced with losing the TARDIS, the Doctor doesn't rail and rage and get 
and angry that she can't get her friends home, and instead it's like, yeah, oh well. But it, it is only three minutes of 43 minutes, though. I know, but it's, it is still the Doctor doing that on the screen and saying, this is my character. You've only seen me for, what, an hour the previous week and 40-odd minutes this week. You haven't seen much of me. This is what I do. And it's like, really? This is what she does? Ugh. Mm, okay, fair enough. Look, I, I, I don't disagree with you, and I certainly, as I say, remember feeling very angry about it at the time, but those those thoughts have softened again as I've... You know, had had a few months to think about them. I just mm. remember it very fondly. Okay, well that takes us through all thirteen, Dave. I want to pose the question I sort of posed at the start, and that's I want to talk about what we think is the most important of these episodes overall. We can then break it into the new Who and the and the classic era stuff. But overall, out of all of them, what do we think is the most important? <laughs> as a sophomore story, not as the best story. Yeah, as a sophomore story. Look, I think that the runner-up is probably the Daleks because of the effect that it had on the whole series to come and, and the role it has and, and the work it does. But I think in terms of setting up a brilliant new direction for the series, setting up a brilliant new Doctor, a new cast, a new dynamic, new values, production, etc., and doing it in such a brilliant way, you can't go past the arc in space. Interesting. That's really interesting. I thought you were going to say Silurians then. I thought, okay. you were say, like, I thought you were going to say runner-up was the Daleks and, and winner was the Silurians. And I was going to say, well, I'm the complete reverse because I think the most important sophomore story here is the Daleks because it does have that influence across the whole series. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important as a sophomore story for the first Doctor, yes, but it just resonates through everything that happens in each series ever again. And then Silurians as the runner-up because I think that that is a, prof- a profound story for the Pertwee Doctor and sets him up, but it's only that one era that it's setting up. So Daleks for me with Silurians as the runner-up and Ark in Space for you with Daleks as runner-up. Yeah, and look, Silurians I think deserve to be in the top three or four. I'm not going to argue with that. And, and I would very happily put the end of the world somewhere in that top three or four as well. Not because it's the greatest story i think it's a very good story but it's not great but just because of the way it so effectively continues an experiment i mean it's hard to remember now just how nervous we all were in 2005 about how this new series of doctor who would go would it succeed and, and the end of the world is a very important step in making that happen and it is the story where we first start to really learn about the Eccleston doctor who who remains my favourite of the new series, Doctors. I, I think that as a piece of sophomore television, the end of the world really should be very high on this list. Yeah, and look, I snap, I can't disagree. Um, when I look at the competition, I look at New Earth, I think, well, it's better than New Earth. Um, it's absolutely better than Beast Below. It's better than Into the Dalek, and it's better than Ghost Monument. So there there it is. It's, it's, mm. it's a no-brainer. Mm. It, it is absolutely the best sophomore story of New Who. And, and a contender across the whole of the series as well. Uh, yeah, look, I'm I'm not sure I would go that far. Oh, look, look, I'm not putting in the same level as the Daleks in the Ark in space, and even the Silurians, but I, I think it, it is, you know, up in that top four. Yeah, it might come around four or five for me. Yeah, probably four. Yeah. Yeah, it's, pr- it's probably ahead of the, um, the Highlanders and such, and yeah, okay, that's fair. Yeah, top four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are there any uh, aspects you wanted to look at before we move on to our mailbag this month? I think just reiterating a point that I've mentioned across the whole thing, that it is very interesting to see where they've used the sophomore story to, to set up a dynamic and to change the direction of the show much more than they can in the regen story. And, and, and I think that's why this was an interesting topic for you to pick, Rob. Everybody looks at the regen stories in terms of restarts, but... In many of these cases, it's actually the sophomore story that tells you more about where this Doctor's going, where this series is going, particularly when you get into the age of the post-regenerative stress nonsense where you know, yeah. there are stories, regen stories, where the Doctor spends half and two-thirds of it sort of wandering around in the days. You really do need these sophomore to, to set it up. And that's why New Earth is so important. David Tennant is unconscious for all but about the last seven minutes of the Christmas Invasion. Now, that works well as a piece of drama. I'm not, I'm not knocking that decision at all. But it makes that second story incredibly important to actually see who this character really is just going about their business. 
yeah, these stories, the Doctor is in their gear, their their costume at the start, they're ready to go. It's it's really the um out of the uh, regen story or the sophomore story. I think I prefer the sophomore stories actually. Yeah, I actually think I'll agree with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, uh, we'll talk about next month's episode at the end of uh, this particular episode. I think for now, Dave, though, we've got two uh, bits of mail we should rip through. 